Hello, welcome back. I was going to make this a two-part video series on radiation, but actually on reflection I've decided to split it into three. So this is now part two of what will be a three-part series on the topic. So here we go, part two. And what I want to cover in part two then uh, are the first two of our alliterative title words. So I'm going to have a look at bad and benign and even benign you'll discover is, um, is a bit of a cheat really but we'll get to that in a few minutes. Well one of the first questions we can ask of course is whether it's not the case that all radioactivity is bad since all we hear about is the damage that it does. And in fact, it's very easy to answer yes uh, in certain circumstances. So I'll be honest with you, I've never found anything particularly positive to say uh, about nuclear weapons. Uh, for instance, I find it very easy to slot that into the uh, into the bad camp with very few caveats. And of course, we're aware also that we have issues with nuclear power generation. So one of the first serious leaks that I remember reading about when I was much younger, way back in the 1970s, uh, was this leak of radioactive coolant water from a nuclear power plant uh, on Three Mile Island in, uh, in the United States. Um, and this was a fairly serious leak because it came out essentially as, as water vapour and therefore dispersed in the atmosphere in the vicinity of, of the power plant. So that was bad enough. And of course since then we've, uh, you know, we've all seen the newsreels and the follow-up documentaries of, of the horrendous uh, meltdown and um, explosion at the Chernobyl power plant. And of course more recently still uh, the effects of the uh, nuclear leaks at the Fukushima plant in, in Japan. And both of those very easy to describe as, as um, producing bad consequences. And of course in the UK we, uh, you know, we've had a pretty good record in terms of leaks from power plants per se. But our nuclear fuel recycling and reprocessing site at Sellafield most certainly has had some uh, publicity grabbing leaks of material, so much so that the beaches nearby have these safety announcements associated with them. Um, there is radioactive material in the sand uh, uh, near this plant um, up in the north of, north of England. So it's very easy, I think, to describe anything on this slide as, as representing a bad aspect of radioactivity. And of course we know why that is. We know that radiation can cause uh, sickness in the short term uh, and um, even loss of life, tragically. But in the longer term we can end up with damage to DNA, so the, the key components of our cells that determine cell division and are involved in, in reproduction and the production of the next generation. <coughs> Excuse me. And of course the radioactive material uh, can get into groundwater, it can get into farmland and so on, uh, and that becomes an issue also in the long term. So for instance, the fallout from Chernobyl was literally rained down onto uh, sheep pastures as far west in our country as, as Wales. Um, and that's still an issue in some parts of the country. It contaminates the sheep that feed on the grass that are growing in and from the um, contaminated soil. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, you know, why do we do this? Uh, why do we bother even trying to produce power uh, from nuclear power plants? Isn't it all bad? Well, let's go back to the nuclear weapons side of things. You'll probably, um, many of you I'm sure, will remember getting one of these um, 
leaflets through the post when you were younger. This came when I was, I suppose, young teenage. Uh, every household in the country was sent one of these leaflets by the government. They were to prepare us, they said, for um, the event of a, of a nuclear attack. This was, remember, during the Cold War period when such threats were fairly abundant. Um, anyone with a smattering of understanding of physics uh, would have read that leaflet and realised that it was a complete nonsense, actually. It was pie in the sky, what they were suggesting. Uh, we, could, uh, we could survive, um, you know, by stacking up doors and going under the stairs and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, it was a nonsense. But I suppose the government of the time thought it might make us feel better uh, and it was therefore worth sending it around just so that we knew they were thinking about us. And there are still legacies. There are legacies from this Cold War period all around. This happens to be the one quite near where, um, uh, where I live. Uh, this is the hill in a place called Victory Woods. And Victory Woods are in the north part of Kent here where this Google Maps marker uh, is. It's on a hill there because from there uh, this um, observation post, which is, is what it was built for, uh, got a pretty good view across to the London Basin. Uh, so Thames Estuary coming through here. Uh, and here's the big conurbation. So from here they could get angular fixes on uh, things like um, uh, blasts and mushroom clouds, you know, that sort of grim stuff. So here am I, and one of my grandsons who's flying a kite. It's a great place for flying kites these days. He's standing on the uh, entrance hatch to this bunker. The little information board nearby gives you a, a sort of cartoon cutaway uh, of what it would have looked like inside. So my grandson is sort of standing up here now. I'm actually standing, uh, you can see this was the summer, shorts are the order of the day. Uh, I was standing uh, over here by this, um, this ventilation shaft. And in between, there would have been cameras and periscope arrangements. Here's one um, tube coming up from the ground here. And across this direction, we're getting to the Thames Valley and, and to London. So, you know, a good place for sighting where these things were coming from. And as I say, these, these long lasting legacies of the Cold War are still, still sitting around us. There was a philosophy that said that nuclear weapons were necessary because uh, mutually assured destruction between the nuclear powers would mean that nobody would ever dare use them, uh, which is a fairly strange statement in itself. But as you know, any of us who've lived long enough will know, there have been a lot of really quite close calls. So false alarms on people's radars, uh, many of you I'm sure will remember the Cuba blockade and, and how um, nail-bitingly close we got to a nuclear confrontation between the United States and, uh, and Russia. So as I say, I find it very hard to think of anything positive to say uh, about nuclear weapons. However, the other part of our opening slide in this section was on nuclear power. And the arguments there are a little bit more nuanced. And here we have to start thinking seriously about risk and balancing risk. So this is a, um, a rather revealing bar chart uh, taken from New Scientist um, just a few years ago. Uh, and it looks at the number of deaths associated with various sources of power. And power is the big driving thing, of course, for um, the advanced countries, at least, of the world. In fact, pretty much all countries of the world. So we have this gruesome scale here, deaths per 10 billion kilowatt hours. So in other words, how many lives does it cost in order to produce a certain amount of power? So if we look at these, uh, these various sources of power, the very first thing you'll notice 
uh, is that coal doesn't come out very well. Right? This is the mining and transportation phase of, of getting coal, dangerous in itself. These, I should say, are worldwide figures. They're not confined to the UK. But the operations phase also, through the effects of air pollution and so on, and the deleterious effect on, on, on health that these things um, generate, for that unit of electrical power produced, so 10 billion kilowatt hours, uh, on average we would expect um, almost 33 people to have died in order to produce that power. So that's a fairly significant number. Um, hydroelectric power we always think of as, as being in some sense clean. Uh, but actually hydroelectric power generation has led to even more deaths per um, unit of power produced. I mean we're almost up to 55 in this, uh, in this figure at the end of the bar here. And there have been some individual catastrophic catastrophic events so almost a quarter of a million people for instance died um, in a series of dam failures in China in 1975. Uh, this was a sequence so one dam went it actually threw the next one in the line and so on uh, and in total tens hundreds of thousands of people lost their lives and of course a lot more people will have been um, left without homes would have been injured and so on and so forth. Then we get to the more safe end of the spectrum. So natural gas for instance, this is something the UK has or at least had its, um, its fair share of, in fact anywhere around the North Sea gets a lot of natural gas, uh, but it comes from other parts of the world as well. And natural gas is, is as I say, relatively safe, so this is less than two people will have uh, on average lost their lives in order to generate this 10 billion kilowatt hours of, of power. And nuclear, you might be surprised to hear, is actually comparable to natural gas. It's actually a little bit lower in fact, but you know, in the same ballpark essentially. Uh, and that includes, for instance, the 9,000 individuals who each tragically lost their lives uh, when the Chernobyl power plant went into meltdown in, in the mid 80s. Um, so, you know, events like this are serious, dreadfully serious, but actually overall around the world, nuclear power turns out to be considerably safer uh, than what has been our mainstay up till now, uh, namely coal. So, you know, if we look at risk in this sense, the equation starts to uh, throw up a few surprises. So let's go to pollution, let's go particularly to um, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and again, we'll look at different forms of producing power. So this is um, a figure, we've got blue and red columns for different forms of power. Uh, the blue is essentially the complete lifetime. Uh, so this would include the mining of the coal, building the coal-fired power station, uh, and then all the way through its operation phase and its decommissioning uh, at the end. The red bars just look at the uh, CO2 emissions or their equivalent uh, during the operation phase. So actually burning coal uh, in this sense. And you'll see again, coal comes out really poorly compared to all the options. Uh, gas is, you know, better, but still pretty seriously flawed uh, in terms of um, the amount of greenhouse gas or its equivalent uh, launched into the environment. Uh, even biomass, which certainly during its operation phase we could say is probably neutral in the sense that what we burn we can regrow and therefore absorb those greenhouse gases back into new plants. But even there, in terms of gobbling up resources, um, you know, the irrigation required to grow the crops in the first place, uh, the transportation, the harvesting and so on and so forth, even there the cost 
in terms of uh, atmospheric pollution is, is really quite significant. And it's not until we get down to solar panels, the things that you know some people have on their roofs, for instance, or tapping geothermal energy. Anyone who's been to Iceland, for instance, will have seen geothermal power plants in operation. The very uh, impressive things. Uh, hydroelectricity, nuclear, and then wind farms, certainly the onshore wind farm variety, the, the offshore ones of which we have a lot around the UK now and a growing number, um, are actually a little bit more costly in terms of their environmental emissions simply because the construction phase uh, is so much more complex um, as you might expect uh, building out on the continental shelf around, um, around a country like the UK. But again, the interesting thing is that the, uh, the, the better performing power supplies are these ones down here and that they include nuclear, which essentially during its operations emits no greenhouse gases. It is only in the um, building of the power station, the enriching of the nuclear fuel, that sort of thing, that we get um, a greenhouse uh, gas emission figure. So anything down here, and as I say, including nuclear power, is actually better for the environment as well as being safer uh, on the whole um, in terms of, of injury and lives lost. Uh, all better than these things up here and particularly gas and coal. And there's another little wrinkle to this story. And again, you know, I'm, I'm going to make this local in this case, although actually comparable numbers uh, come out for coal that's mined wherever you are in the world. Um, coal doesn't just contain carbon, it contains a lot of other elements as well. It includes in its makeup radioactive elements radioactive isotopes. So uranium and radium, for instance, are both found in British coals. In fact, they're found at a level that will give you um, about 14 and a half radioactive events per second for every kilogram of coal. The Becquerel, you'll remember, was simply one radioactive decay per second. Uh, coal also contains uh, thorium. Um, thorium, another element that has radioactive isotopes, and in coal that will give you uh, a comparable number of radioactive events per second per kilogram, in this case 12 and a half. So, you know, putting these things together, we're, what, we're up to 20, um, 27 events per second. But look, we've got radioactive isotopes of potassium in coal as well, associated with a whopping 150 radioactive events per second for every kilogram of coal. And of course what do we do with coal? In power stations we burn it, uh, the result goes up through the chimney, uh, we're only extracting the heat of combustion from this process, so all of this stuff is actually being piped out of the chimney of coal-fired power stations. So, you know, if we're going to think about radioactive material being put into the atmosphere, into the environment, we even have to think about that and factor that in when we're thinking about mainstay power generation um, coming from uh, coal, for instance. So this is not a simple, straightforward uh, monochrome question that we're asking here. There is nuance uh, to this. It is, as I said right at the beginning of this section, a matter of balancing risk. And of course we get uh, bad things happening from things other than power generation and these can be really extraordinarily serious. Very recently uh, we've had, I mean, so this is back in, in uh, beginning of 2019, you'll remember that Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris burned its roof 
was covered in lead. That lead melted, some of it vaporised. Lots of lead went into the atmosphere and was carried downwind uh, across Paris and beyond uh, and would have settled out on the ground, for instance. Now, we wouldn't dream of having lead pipework for our domestic plumbing anymore, uh, something the Romans pioneered way, way back, because we know that it does serious damage to um, our nervous systems and indeed can impair the, uh, the development of, of young children. But here we are in this one accident and, you know, that's all we can describe it as in this one accident depositing huge amounts of lead over millions of people. So risk, as I say, has to be looked at in the round. If you remember far enough back, uh, and in fact we're going back to the mid-1980s now, uh, the Bhopal chemical plant um, disaster in India. This was a plant, you'll remember, that was um, owned by Union Carbide. Huge chemical leak of extraordinarily toxic materials from this, pa uh, from this um, chemical plant, which can, uh, killed huge, I mean thousands upon thousands of people at the time, and remains a cause of birth defects and so on, um, all this time later. So effects in a sense, short term and longer term, that can be stacked up, if we're just thinking about bare risk here, can be stacked up against uh, things like um, nuclear power. So this, this really does need thinking about in the round. Well, let's come now to the, um, uh, the accident in, in Fukushima. And you'll remember uh, that there was a, um, that this was basically a tsunami that caused the initial thing. Uh, this table, which appeared in uh, 2011 um, in, the, um, in the Guardian, sets the doses that people received in and around the Fukushima power plant in the context of a whole range of other things. So again, this is looking at it as a source of risk. So after the tsunami, but before the power plant had suffered its explosion, uh, there were about one millisieverts um, being um, released uh, around that plant. And a millisievert, remember, was another form of measurement of radi radioactive uh, dosage. And it was the one that was optimized for um, predicting, measuring the risk to uh, organic material, living material. So this is the one that's important when we're thinking about health effects uh, for humans, for instance. And our table begins down here with a dental x-ray, very low number, 0 0.01, so one hundredth of a millisievert. We all have those, I imagine. Uh, you know, I have, uh, I have one of those a year at least. Um, chest x-rays, 10 times more radiation exposure. If you um, have a mammogram, we go up again, so this is now four times a chest x-ray, for instance, and about two and a half times that, so the equivalent then of, say, ten chest x-rays, was this dose from Fukushima before the exposure. But now let's, let's go up the list. Uh, up here somewhere, um, we get to the natural radiation that we all are exposed to every year. So it's coming from space, it's coming from the ground beneath our feet. In fact, the number in the UK is closer to three than two. Um, this, is, this is unavoidable. I'm going to come back to this later. But that's already twice what was happening uh, before the explosion at Fukushima. If you were taking annual, uh, sorry, uh, regular flights, um, long distance air flights, 
your dosage goes up again. This particular example is, is for airline crew uh, on the New York to Tokyo uh, route. So this would be their annual exposure. If you've ever had a full body um, CT scan, you're in the same ballpark. So, you know, the airline crew nine millisieverts per year are for CT scan 10. And then we go up and up and up and up. And actually after the explosion, you can see we're up to serious levels of radiation coming out uh, from around the Fukushima plant uh, up here. And we're now in the uh, hinterland of radiation sickness, so nausea and so on. Um, and, you know, we have to go up maybe a factor of 10 from this level before we get to the point where you would expect people to start dying within a few weeks uh, of exposure. So this is a this is a long scale. This is everything from one hundredth of a millisievert all the way up to a thousand millisieverts. Um, you know, so that that's what a scale, a variation of, of one hundred thousand uh, between one and the other. And it starts to give you a feeling for how risks escalate. Um, so, you know, this end of the scale, definitely, I think we can put in the bad camp. Uh, this end of the scale, uh, we have to think a little bit more seriously about what our priorities are. In other words, balancing the risks in our lives. So let's move on to what I call benign radioactivity in the main title for this series. And benign is a it's a bit of a cheat. It, it you know went nicely in the title, but actually uh, it's more like the radiation that we choose to receive, uh, or the radiation that is completely unavoidable. And you might ask why we choose to receive radiation, but I'll, you know, I'll, I'll dive into that in a slide or two's time. So we're being irradiated from space. Uh, cosmic rays are coming in um, and, um, you know, they're associated with, with deep space. They're associated with solar wind and so on. Uh, radiation that's coming into the atmosphere. And we can think of them as being very similar to the gamma rays that I talked about in the first video in the series. If we go higher in the atmosphere, in other words, we, we lose the shielding of the atmosphere above our heads, or at least a fraction of that shielding, then obviously our radiation exposure from space is going to go up. So if you fly a lot, you will get uh, more exposure to radiation coming in from, from space. So those are definitely in the unavoidable camp, um, or at least this one is in the unavoidable camp. We choose to fly, so in, in that sense we are choosing to increase our exposure to radiation. And medical diagnostics and medical therapy using radiation are definitely things that we, uh, we choose. Uh, we would choose to have radiotherapy rather than uh, the ongoing risk of um, hosting a tumour, for instance, and rightly so. But it's not just coming from space, um, it's coming also from the ground beneath our feet. So granite, for instance, is a, is a particular um, place from whence you know, radiation comes at us. So if you've ever taken a holiday uh, in the West Country of the UK, for instance, or in the region around Aberdeen, uh, in both places, the underlying bedrock is, is granite. You will have subjected yourself, you will have chosen to subject yourself to a, a slightly increased radiation dose. Um, so radiation is all around us. Uh, it is in many senses unavoidable or um, you know we choose it but we choose it because we accept that the risk is actually very low. Uh, 
So let's have a look at the stuff coming from the ground beneath us in a little bit more detail here. Uh, and the key thing when it comes to granite uh, is this part of the uranium decay chain. Now you remember I showed you this diagram in the first video uh, and it told us how uranium up here top right decays through all sorts of radioactive emission events all the way down here to uh, a stable isotope, in this case a stable isotope of lead. But it's this one we need to think about in terms of granite. And it's important because um, granite contains a radioactive element called radium. Uh, and radium decays, it's got a half-life as it shows here of uh, 1620 years, it decays into radon and as it decays it does so by uh, alpha emission, this is alpha radiation, but it produces another, a daughter element, radon, which is itself radioactive, that's also an alpha emitter, uh, it decays to polonium. Uh, polonium, you might remember, was, was um, or at least a radioactive uh, isotope of polonium, was what was used to kill Mr. Litvinenko um, a few years back. But it's this one I want to focus on, because radon is a gas. So within the granite we're getting a radioactive gas generated by radioactive decay. And that gas of course can percolate out to the surface, which is why we need to consider it carefully. So let's have a look um, at this in, in context now. So our average radioactive dose in the UK is about 2.7 millisieverts per year. I told you a few slides back that it was closer to three than the two that was listed. So 2.7 is our average across the UK. And then there are areas like the West Country down here uh, where that level goes up because granite is there in large quantities and just beneath the surface. So the background numbers for Cornwall, for instance, are three times the national average. So we're up at 7.8 uh, millisieverts. Um, sounds a lot, but as we all know, uh, people have lived uh, and worked and holidayed in Cornwall and Devon and around there for countless generations and they've done so uh, quite safely without significant deleterious effects to their health. So we need to put this into context straight away. This is not something to get scared about. These are simply uh, the physical numbers associated um, with a particular form of mineral. Okay, it's important to be aware of these things, um, but we need to better put them into context, and that is one of the things I'm hoping to be able to do uh, through these slides. So that's one particular uh, place where we we take things very seriously, and in fact, the building regulations in these parts of the country, so um, you know, we're talking about Cornwall now in particular, for instance, um, are changed in order to mitigate the effects of this radioactive radon gas coming out of, um, out of the ground underneath. So buildings will be raised, for instance, above the ground somewhat more than they would have to be in the um, rest of the country to allow some very significant air circulation to take place uh, between the ground and the floor level, ground floor level uh, in the building. And we can even in the floor build in a gas um, seal so that the radon doesn't get to come through that and into the building proper. And of course that's important because we build uh, houses now and commercial buildings and so on specifically with good ceiling. We don't want drafts and so on because we want to conserve uh, 
heat energy on the inside. So we have double glazing, we have close fitting doors and so on and so forth. Um, if we were getting radioactive gas coming up through the floor, we would essentially be confining it uh, into the building. And that's something we obviously don't want. So these very logical and straightforward building regulation designs um, stop that happening. So, you know, it's not it's not something to be dreadfully worried about, particularly. And actually, if, if there's a h even higher than average amount of um, radon coming out of the air where you're building, you can always stick a powered fan into these vents and actually force a higher, <coughs> excuse me, a higher flow of air um, underneath the floor and get rid of the radon, get it out into the atmosphere where uh, it will disperse and dilute. Uh, even where I live in Kent, we've had our um, scary stories in the local press so a little over a year ago and although they didn't say it in explicit terms, uh, it was an article that was um, likely, I think, to engender a little bit of fear uh, in the residents that were, um, that were reading it. Uh, so you'll notice, if you can see it, I'll read it out to you. Uh, according to government research, Kent is one of the worst affected parts of the UK, it says. Um, and actually that's a nonsense, a complete nonsense. Um, there is radiation coming out, out of the soil in Kent, just as there is over every part of the Earth's surface. But it's not, um, it's not at a level that I think we need to be, um, we need to be getting too worried about. Well, this is probably a good time uh, to have a look at some examples of radioactive minerals in the earth and just um, see what the Geiger counter pits picks up. So I'm going to turn this back on again and you'll get the um, sort of low level of clicking that we got in the first video when I was showing you how these things work and telling you a little bit about um, background levels of, of radiation and so on. So it's just the occasional click that you'll pick up, okay? And the very first thing we should look at uh, is a sample of granite. So this has been roughly polished on each side. It's, I don't know, half a centimetre thick. And you'll notice that background counts are really not, um, sorry, the counts are really not changing very much from background levels. Um, and I wouldn't actually, uh, I wouldn't expect that. If we go back to that very first video, you'll remember that I made the point that there's a, um, a grid on the front here and a thin film covering the front face of this detector, uh, which obviously keeps the gas in, but also however thin it is, it's going to have a tendency to stop alpha particles coming in. Okay, so because radium and indeed radon uh, are alpha emitters, we really would expect quite a low count rate simply because our Geiger counter is not set up to be very sensitive to alpha decays. Okay, so again, I can stick this um, granite right on the front and you'll see almost no change in the count rate being indicated on the meter there or listening to the clicks coming in. If there is any increase, it's probably not coming from uh, low penetrating power alpha particles. But if you think back to our uranium decay chain, the decays in that chain are not all 
alpha decays. There are a few beta decays um, and for some of the other radioactive elements in the earth um, there'll be some gamma ray decays as well. And it's those that this particular Geiger counter is much much more sensitive at picking up. So let's move on to some other minerals and I've got some various other uh, ones here that uh, my colleagues in the University of Kent School of Physical Sciences have very kindly uh, loaned to me for this session. Uh, and the first one we're going to look at is something called uh, Toganite, and this actually comes from the Congo. Hear the difference? It's pretty remarkable. We're up to, um, according to that meter, about 150, 160 counts per second. All right, now again, if you uh, remember back to the first video, I told you that um, these are unlikely to be alpha particles. Not only is there a um, cover on the end of this tube, but as you'll see, these radioactive samples are actually uh, double contained in plastic bags for fairly obvious, I hope fairly obvious, health and safety reasons. Um, so there aren't any alpha particles that we're detecting coming from here. Can we determine whether it's beta or gamma? Well, as I say, go back to that first video and this um, ring pull candlid should be able to tell us whether there are a lot of um, beta particles coming off here because this would actually stop all but the most high energy uh, versions of those. So let's cover up our mineral with this um, tin can lid. All right, we got up to about 150 counts per second before, and you'll notice now we're on about 30. So it's about a factor five down. So I would contend that the majority of what was coming off this particular mineral uh, was beta radiation. Um, inside this plastic bag, plastic because I don't want my fingers or anybody else's fingers picking up the lead sheet that is inside. So if I cover this with lead, you'll notice the count rate goes back almost to background level. So I think we can safely um, conclude that we've got maybe a mixture of beta decays going on here. Um, some of them high enough energy to get through this tin lid. Not many of them, but some. About 20% are getting through. But our, um, our millimetre of lead sheet inside this plastic bag is enough to stop it. Uh, so there are various others I could look at here and they're all actually much of a muchness. The one I do want to try uh, in addition is actually this sample at the end of the line here and this is pitch blend and I've chosen this one particularly because this is one of the minerals that um, Marie and Pierre Curie um, studied when they were doing their initial work on radioactive decays. So let's, let's see what this one is like. And it's very similar. You can see where, again, we're up to 150, 160, 170 counts per second. Um, so pitch blend is obviously quite um, quite active. That sample actually comes from um, uh, from Galloway, so it's uh, it's from from Ireland. We cover that with our tin lid. Let's see what happens. Well, actually, it's gone down. It's gone down from 150 to about 40 again. So we've lost some, uh, but not all. So we've probably got some beta particle emission from there, maybe some gamma as well. We stick our lead sheet on top. Um, you'll notice the count rate drops substantially again. And this also illustrates a very basic health and safety fact with sources of radiation. 
um, and it'll um, it'll remind you a little bit about the advice we've been given on on the COVID virus. Sorry, let me remove this. It's getting a little bit annoying, isn't it? Um, the key thing is distance. So the further are you, the further away you are from a radioactive source, the lower the dose rate you will be receiving. Um, shielding is very important. So we put a little bit of metal uh, in there in the form of this um, tin can lid and it will cut out all but the higher energy uh, beta particles. If we put a bit of lead in the way, and this is only a millimetre of lead, it will actually chop out all of the beta particles and a fraction of the gamma rays uh, coming off as well. Very much as I tried to outline in the first video in the series. Um, and the other thing of course is time. One minimises the time that you're exposed to the radioactive source and as soon as I finish this short clip uh, you can trust me this will be all packed away and um, kept at a distance until I can return it to my uh, uh, to my colleagues at the University of Kent. So distance, time, shielding, those are all things that you know one can uh, one can take into account in order to minimize the effect. So I'm just going to stick one of these other uh, minerals in there. This happens to be um, a little bit of mineral. You can see a, actually quite a tiny amount of mineral that's come from somewhere in the Congo. And I've chosen this one because I happen to know it's got a very high count rate. So let's stick our meter on top of that. And I notice we're well over um, 200 now. This is getting on for 300 counts per second. But I only have to change the distance here a little bit. I'm only a centimetre off that mineral now and you'll notice the count rate's dropped a lot. If I double the distance, we're down to a quarter of what it was uh, when I was um, down on the packet itself. And I really don't have to raise it much. So I'm here possibly 20 centimetres above the mineral and we're already at only twice the background level roughly. So distance is a really important thing in terms of uh, protecting yourself. So one of the mottos uh, that used to be around for those you know working around sources of radiation uh, was very very simple. It was run far, run fast. So you increase your distance, you decrease the time um, over which you've been exposed. And of course, if we add into that shielding, uh, then you become safer still. So that's um, my little bit, of, um, little bit of demonstration of some of the bits and pieces that are lying around in the ground on the Earth's surface that are associated with a lot um, of the radiation that we can measure near the surface. And again, I need to reiterate that this tube is not good at picking up alpha radiation. Um, so it wouldn't be good at detecting uh, the radium in our slice of granite rock, um, even though there is almost certainly some in there. So don't get fooled. By a very low count you need to make sure that your Geiger counter uh, is actually set up and optimized for what it is you might be studying. Okay that'll do. So let's have a look at flying. This is another one of those things that we volunteer for. Uh, there are all sorts of reasons for not flying but I venture to suggest and I hope I convince you through this slide that uh, the risk of radiation exposure is not one of them. So there's this uh, famous case of a guy called uh, Tom Stuka who was a businessman who flew a lot and when I say a lot uh, we're talking about three and three quarter years um, over his 
14 year traveling business life uh, where he covered apparently something like 18 million miles. So this is a guy who spent a lot of his time in the air. Um, and the article, this is from Scientific American, the article uh, filled in all sorts of other things, you know, how many in-flight meals and visits to the toilet he probably had and that sort of stuff, which, you know, is, doesn't need to worry us too much. But he was doing a lot of long haul flying. He was therefore flying at high altitude and his exposure to uh, cosmic radiation, so the stuff coming from space, increased accordingly. And in fact, if you go higher still, so if, if you're living on the International Space Station, for instance, then you're going to get higher radiation doses um, again. And in fact, the um, astronauts on the um, space station get about 360 times the average uh, dose that we would get down on the ground. Um, and those sort of things, of course, have to be factored in when we're thinking longer term, uh, as seems to be the case at the moment, about establishing uh, colonies on the moon, for instance, or even traveling uh, to Mars. Uh, the radiation doses are going to be really quite significant uh, in those cases. But anyway, let's go back to Mr. Stuka. His uh, total radiation dose, three and three quarter years in the air, was about 100 millisieverts. All right, a chest X-ray, you might remember from a few slides back, was at about 0.1 millisievert. So he had the equivalent of about a thousand chest X-rays by taking all of these flights. You know, and we are talking about thousands of flights here. So more than most of us, I would venture to suggest. So here comes the bit about context. Even with all of that, and remember in the UK, our average dose is about 2.7 millisieverts per year anyway. Um, we have to think in terms of overall risk to health. So, uh, Mr. Suka, self-evidently a man, so I'm gonna take statistics from the male of the species, about a quarter of men will contract a potentially fatal can, uh, cancer during their years. So 25% of men. Uh, Mr. Stuka's risk increased because of this additional exposure to 25.5%. So there is an increased risk, but actually it's not huge. It really is not huge. Uh, in terms of the probability of getting one of these potentially fatal cancers, uh, it, it went up from 25 to 25.5%. Okay. In other words, uh, this was about a 2% increase in his risk of getting a potentially fatal cancer. Okay, so again, uh, let's look at where all our radiation is coming from, what we can avoid, what we can't avoid, and so on. Um, and these are some quite interesting, very basic uh, um, but interesting um, divisions of, of where the radiation is coming from. So all of this top section of our table is essentially um, stuff that's coming from around us that we really can't do anything about. Uh, so it's breathing, it's eating and drinking, it's standing on the earth and it's standing underneath the skies above. So if we add all of this stuff up, I'll come back to food and water later on, but if we add all of this stuff up, we get to somewhere between two and three, on average, let's say 2.4 in this case, uh, millisieverts per year coming at us from the environment. So this is radiation from nature. 
this is most definitely uh, unavoidable. And then we come to the stuff that we could avoid uh, if we didn't have nuclear power plants, um, if we didn't have weapons testing, if we decided we never would have uh, an x-ray in our lives. Um, and that comes to 0.61, so 2.4 we cannot avoid, uh, 0.61 um, we probably could, but look, of that 0.61, almost all of it is coming from the medical sphere. Almost all of it is coming from the x-rays that we have uh, on our teeth and on our chests and on our bones and so on and so forth. Um, so if we add all those things up, from nature we've got this number here, 2.4, from everything associated with, with nuclear or radiation technology, including the medical x-rays that we have, it's 0.61. In other words, 80% of what we get each year is coming from sources that are totally unavoidable. And most of the other 20% is coming from stuff that we uh, willingly choose, like x-rays. So that sort of, again, puts things into perspective. It, it balances, I think, uh, the numbers against the risk associated with them. But I talked about eating and drinking, for instance, earlier on as a, as a way of, uh, you know, exposing ourselves to radiation. So let's just have a look at a few things. So here we've got, for instance, a litre of milk. A litre of milk uh, will be approximately 60 becquerel, so 60 radioactive decay events per second in every litre of milk, on average. Um, a 70 kilogram human adult, and I confess that is lighter than I am these days, uh, 10,000 becquerel. So 10,000 radio, uh, radioactive decay events per second uh, in the human body. You are a source of radiation. And then we come back to granite again, which, because of the um, radium decaying into radon, has, relatively speaking, uh, quite a quite a high level of radioactive decay events going on uh, within it. So here we are, back in context again. I'll switch off the Geiger counter. Let's look at the human body. Right. I, I mentioned us as a radiation source on the previous slide. Let's look at some of the elements within our bodies and where that radiation comes from. 70% of the human body is water. And within water, of course, H2O, uh, two of the three atoms are the element hydrogen. Hydrogen has various isotopes. Um, the principal one, deuterium, is, is stable, so it's not radioactive. But there is another one, uh, tritium. So this has the one proton that makes it hydrogen, but it also has two neutrons in the nucleus, and that makes it unstable, it makes it radioactive. So, you know, here's one source of radiation. Uh, from within the human body. Why is it there? Well, it's because we've eaten stuff and we've eaten stuff um, that contains this mix of isotopes of hydrogen. We have a huge amount of carbon within us, of course. Uh, most of it we wouldn't need to consider in the context of this talk, so carbon-12 is the most common isotope of carbon and that's stable, it's not radioactive at all. Likewise, this isotope carbon-13. But when we come to carbon-14, it is radioactive. In fact, this was the first example, you may remember, of a radioactive decay um, that I showed you way back in uh, near the beginning of, of the first video in the series.
and we're going to come back to carbon-14 because it's actually quite an interesting element in its own right. Uh, isotope, I should say. Sodium. We've got a lot of sodium in our bodies. Salt, right? Sodium chloride. Uh, and again, the most common isotope is, is perfectly stable. It's not radioactive. But there is this radioactive isotope. Um, of sodium and in fact a whole bunch of others out here as well that are less common but nevertheless radioactive that will add to the human body's uh, radiation we have phosphorus in large quantities in our bones for instance and although there is one stable and the most common isotope of phosphorus there are these others in white and particularly here in yellow um, that are radioactive. So, you know, our bodies are made up of elements uh, and within those elements there are isotopes that are unstable, that are radioactive. And that's why the human body actually has radioactive decay events going on within its, um, you know, within its very makeup uh, every second of every day. And it's coming from what we eat. So this is a good point, I think, to take another break. I'm going to terminate this video here and then we'll come back to part three and I'll look at, you'll remember the third word in our title, uh, which is beneficial. Are there forms of radiation that actually have positive use that we can describe as being genuinely beneficial? So I'll see you again in part three. Bye for now.